brothers and sisters, uh, it is very good to see you today. I'm delighted to uh, come to you again uh, on the uh, specific uh, topic of uh, Afrocentricizing the decolonial process in knowledge, education, and images. Again, we're always happy to have uh, international guests. And so far, we have guests from Brazil as well as from South Africa and many places in the U.S. And I'm sure that before we are finished, there will be many other guests as well. So we're, we're very excited uh, to, to see you and to have you here uh, in this uh, program today. Uh, I have tried to um, uh, mute uh, everybody so that we can uh, make sure that we are uh, able to listen. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, when we have questions, uh, I will unmute you so that uh, if you have questions, you can certainly ask those questions of me. So that's the, the general setup. And I just want to also say to you that, uh, you know, we, we are coming to you from the Maleficati Asante Institute and from uh, the Department of Africology at Temple University, but always with a very uh, heavy heart, given the situation that we are going through. Uh, I have just concluded about 10 minutes ago an interview with the uh, television station in Istanbul uh, on the question of uh, the police uh, in, uh, in, in the U.S. Now, of course, everyone knows that the police in Turkey are probably like the police anywhere else. But we, we talked about the notion of defunding the police and I sort of indicated to them something that I wanted to announce first here and I've mentioned it earlier that uh, I am proposing a Harriet Tubman restoration project. And I'm not calling it reparations, I'm calling it the Harriet Tubman restoration project. And uh, actually, uh, Harriet Tubman is uh, our most uh, important and significant uh, uh, fighter against uh, the enslavement of Africans. Uh, she did more than anybody else to undermine the system itself. And that is what is critical here. Uh, but the Restoration Project, uh, I take this term actually from uh, Dr. Maulana Karenga's notion uh, that he explored in his thesis on Ma'at, uh, the notion of Saruj Ta, which means basically to restore the land uh, to the place it was before the flood, or to repair the land in the same way that it had existed before the Nile River had overflowed its banks. And this is uh, basically what I mean by restoration. So, 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 so my notion of this idea of restoration is central uh, to um, uh, the uh, entire process of how African people must view the relationship that we have uh, to all of these several governments, wherever we exist in the world, that there has to be Sarujtar, the restoration. And this project, in this project, Here's the thing, and this is what I just told the people in Istanbul. Uh, the, the police uh, force in America has become increasingly militarized. Uh, in fact, some of them have tanks. Uh, many of them, of course, have armored vehicles. And what this has done is and it has given uh, a sort of hubris to the police who operate as if they are, and they are in many instances, occupation forces. So uh, when people are calling for the defunding of the police, they're not necessarily calling for the disappearance of all police, but they're asking the question, why in a civil society must the police be a military force? And part of the funding of the police uh, uh, has come from the fact of the criminalization of black people, uh, the arresting of black 
men particularly and women, but for uh, uh, having or possessing small uh, uh, bits of, of marijuana, for example. So you increase the prison population, you increase the job opportunities for white people to be guards and police, and you grow the budget of the police force uh, without necessarily having a more secure society. So, so I'm calling in the Harriet Tubman Restoration Project for a national police reform uh, with oversight uh, that we would reduce the size of the police and we would take some responsibilities out of the hands of the police. Uh, you know, things like uh, dealing with the homeless uh, or social issues, mental ill issues where police go and shoot uh, mentally ill people because they say they didn't act fast enough or they didn't uh, obey their orders and so forth. So we have to deal with this notion of the criminal injustice system. Mm -hmm. And we have to reduce the black prison population by 50% in the next 10 years. And I think that this is extremely important that if we uh, deal with the, uh, uh, the prison population, we will understand that it is uh, much too large and it's much too large mainly because of the criminalization, criminalization of black people. And then I think there should be health care for all. Uh, this, is, this is part of this restoration. And then I think there should be in the US urban economic recovery plans. Uh, $10 trillion needs to be invested in at least 100 cities over the next 20 years. Uh, federal and local funding, the creation of black business districts, such as we are trying to do here in Philadelphia with Africa Town in the southwestern part of the city where we have a large population of people who have recently come from the continent, affordable housing with market assistance, job creation and infrastructure projects, summer work, uh, municipal work, and, uh, and homeless relief with uh, social work assistance. Uh, this is what we, we're calling for. And, and of course, there are many other things. I will try to flesh this out in the next few weeks to have a full-blown proposal here. Um, and then, of course, the, the fundamental part of this is the overturn of the notion of white racial domination and white racial supremacy. These are two things that uh, uh, really uh, have been on my mind for a long time. Uh, so let me start off by saying, first of all, I, I appreciate everybody who's here, but I'm, I'm really particularly happy to see uh, many of my, my old friends and, and some of my new friends and some of you already know what I'm going to say. You know everything that I know. And so, so it's just good to see you here. I'm very happy to see Brother Carlton and Habib. Of course, they're my close friends here in Philadelphia. And um, uh, uh, young brother uh, Hadi and uh, uh, all uh, uh, Dr. Nadav is here. And uh, many, many, many people. Brother uh, Ma uh, Mashu Dubele uh, is here. Uh, and also Shanudi Swahili, so and uh, Dr. Emeka, so many, many, many people, uh, and I will, we will all share uh, later on as we start talking. But let me tell you why this issue of Afrocentricizing the the the, the decolonial uh, has come to my attention, and while it is important that we try to put this in terms of Afrocentric understanding. Um, over the past maybe uh, 15 to 20 years, there has grown up a, a movement uh, that is based on a notion of decoloniality. And this notion, just like all notions that come out of the West, whether they are Southern West, as this notion I call it, it's a Southern West, um, uh, fundamentally uh, ar ar arises uh, uh, in support in many ways of the West, as I will explain. Uh, the, these notions come up and 
Before long, they are adopted and adapted to the African uh, context. And uh, as I've been uh, living and traveling in Africa, over and over again, I've seen uh, different ones of these ideas uh, come up and they, are, they emerge in an African intellectual context or most often in the university settings. Uh, where uh, African students particularly uh, voice these ideas as if these ideas uh, have given them a new uh, idea of redemption, that they have somehow found uh, uh, what they used to call the Holy Grail in Europe, right? That they've got it, that this is it. And it is, it's lasted, this has been going on for some time. It's not just the last 15 years with decoloniality. Hey folks, I'm Joe Biden. With, I like to, I like to ask you to join we, my campaign. We had this, uh, let me see if I can uh, mute uh, all here. Okay, uh, uh, we, we have, um, um, we, 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 we have had this, we've had this problem uh, with maybe probably from the days that we had originally the development with uh, 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 with Sartre, maybe Sartre and the uh, Negritude movement gave us that relationship where some uh, European intellectual uh, gives us an idea and we take that idea and we use that idea as if that idea is somehow uh, the principal salvation of black people. So, so that has happened. So over the last few years, the idea that emerges on the African continent, and I run into it all the time from one university to the next, is decoloniality. And uh, so I decided that I, what I should do is to interrogate this idea because it, it sounds like a good idea. I mean, and there are certain aspects of it, that are quite useful and quite uh, significant and quite important for those of us who are uh, in the Afrocentric movement. It is not all bad, and I'm not uh, necessarily one of the people who will just condemn uh, decoloniality just outright and say that it is all bad. But I will show you what the problems are and also try to explain to you how we as uh, Afrocentric people uh, view the realities that we confront. And, and let me start by just giving one, one example of something that occurred so that you will have some idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, a few years ago at the University of Cape Town, the African students forced uh, other students to join with them in pulling down the statue of Cecil John Rhodes, the great racist, the big racist in Africa, maybe one of the two of the most uh, significant, uh, you know, I can't even say that because there's so many races, white races who were in the continent, but I was gonna say Henry Stanley and Cecil John Rhodes, but then uh, Carl Peters came to mind. There, there are many, but at any rate, here's the point. They pulled down the statue of Cecil John Rhodes in a, in a fit of not decolonization, because of course that had occurred with a political situation, but with an idea of doing what was necessary, and that was getting rid of the iconic uh, statues and the images of the uh, colonizers and the settlers who had basically raped the African continent. But the question was then, what do we know about Africa itself? How does Africa assert its own historical narrative in that space? What is the African narrative? So that we've pulled down, we've de there's, a, there's a reaction here in terms of what we call a, a decolonial process, but, but then what do you do? So, so this is where uh, even in, we, we just had a Philadelphia, where I am, we just had a situation a few days ago, four or five days ago, where we had a statue, look at this, a statue of a man by the name of Frank Rizzo that had stood for uh, almost 30 years at downtown Philadelphia in one of the city uh, buildings, at, at, at an entrance to one of the city 
uh, buildings uh, where they do city government business. And this man was one of the biggest white supremacists in the history of the city of Philadelphia. And, and the uh, white community got together about 30, 30 years ago and decided they're going to put a statue up. And, and we protested, but we never were able to take it down. Fortunately, it was taken down late one night, four or five days ago, and it's gone. But now the question is, how do we assert the ethic and the morality and the narrative of a human view coming out of the African world? What's our ideology? Where do we stand on these things? And that takes me back to the uh, Jopian two cradle theory. And I'm not going to spend much time on it because I'm sure most of you have read it and you have seen it. But Jope claimed that there were two cradles of civilization. One was a southern cradle and the other was the northern cradle. Now this is after the origin of humanity, homo sapiens in the continent of Africa. And this was after, of course, the migration out of Africa by some of these homo sapiens to other parts of the world. And the ones that went to uh, uh, Europe, uh, they, the ones that were there even during the Verm Ice Age, uh, they, of course, responded uh, to the climactic changes from Africa. And out of that grew a particular culture response, not just to other people, but to nature itself. And that the Southern uh, uh, concept was much more agrarian. And in fact, uh, sedentary, sedentary, not necessarily uh, as nomadic, for example, as we found in the Northern Cradle. And uh, Jake, uh, Job's work has been uh, 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 referred to a lot in the writings of uh, the, one of our colleagues, Dr. Nadav. And it is a very, very useful notion that she has expanded this to talk about racialized power relations, that in the northern nomadic uh, so-called control dominating culture, you had a power relationship that was established between the females and the males. And that that gave us a, a, a particular notion about how Europe would expand itself into the realm, not just of the power relationships in a domestic sense between females and males, but how it would establish the notion of hierarchy. And hierarchy, of course, uh, is a result of this dominating notion of patriarchy, you see? So, so I want to talk about that in, because when we start talking about police brutality, as we have, and just as I said, when I just talked to TRT, the, the, the television people in Istanbul, you know, I said, police brutality is just a symptom. It's not the real problem. Even uh, my good friend and my former student, who has written a brilliant book, uh, How to Be uh, an Anti-Racist, Ibram Kendi's book, is an important book, but How to Be an Anti-Racist still gets us in the cocoon of racism itself. That the, the issue is, is beyond that. It's beyond the notion of racism. We got to get to the bottom of this. And the bottom of this has to do with Eurocentric ideologies, uh, Arabocentric ideologies, Hindu-centric ideologies, uh, Judo-centric ideologies. The Noah story, for example, uh, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. I mean, what's that about? <laughs> you know, what's the light and dark about in uh, Hindu uh, uh, stories and the Bhagavad Gita, for example? Uh, what's that about? What's the notion of Abd in the Islamic notion, this notion of slave? And why is the so-called slave different from other people and so on? I mean, these, 
These, and then in the Eurocentric thing, you got not just the Bible itself, but you got also all of their literature and the philosophical writings that have made this notion of white racial domination based on rankings and hierarchy. Who is at the top? The Aryans are at the top and the Alpines are next and the Mediterraneans are there, there. and then down and down and down the, the, the Asians and then on down, down, down the native, uh, the First Nations people and Africans and so forth. There's a whole ranking, it's a hierarchical system. But that hierarchical system started first with patriarchy, with the domination of the woman and with the creation of these separate notions of who could be what and, and who could uh, 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 be considered uh, equal to who and so on. So when we deal with the questions of race, we are dealing with a false concept. It's an illusion. And we not have claimed that. You have a lot of people write, and many social scientists write about it. And they say, you know, race is a, is a social construct. It was an idea that was just created to, to separate people. But it was not just to separate people that race was developed. Because they've always been uh, for, for thousands of years. And even if you go back to the creation of, I mean, to the, to the beginning, the origin of homo, homo sapiens, you have people, different clans going in different places and living in different places. So they would have biological, they would eventually have biological things that, well, these were darker, these were lighter, uh, and so forth, you see? But they were all humans, right? But what, what Europe did was to take difference and then to weaponize difference. They weaponized difference by saying that if you were this color, and if you had this type of hair, you were at a higher ranking on the ladder of what they call human civilization. That is the problem, okay? That's the fundamental. So that problem is bigger than the problem of police brutality. Police brutality comes out of that because the police feels that he or she has no other way to act than to act on the basis of what they see when they see a black person. When they see a black person, they are not seeing a person that they see as a human being equal to them. In fact, the whole idea was that black people in their minds were not human, you see. This is, a, and, and so this process of, 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 of us in their minds becoming human has become because of our struggle and our fight and our battles and our uh, insistence and persistence as the first human beings and the mothers and fathers of civilization to try to create a world that's more peaceful. So now, what is, uh, what is colonialism? And this is uh, part of what I wanted to, to, to say because I think it's extremely important that we all understand this. It, it, it is the imposition of an outside power over the territory of a free people. It is normally political power taking over the executive, legislative, and judicial. Let me see if I can. I think I'm just, I, I just want to do some, there's a little clean up here. I think I may have to uh, mute uh, some, some new people. Okay, but I think it's important that we, we do this so that we won't be, be, be disturbed. Okay, so, but, but what is it then that we talk about when we talk about this? We're talking about how people deal with uh, economic power, political power, uh, with cultural power, imposing education, arts, religion, and the philosophy of Europe on other people. That's, for example, I mean, it can, not just Europe. I mean, it could be, it could be, the, it could be the, the people in, um, in India who were imposing on many of the different people in India a, a particular cultural uh, reality. It could be people in Turkey imposing, say, for example, on the Kurds. It could, it could be people in, um, in Israel imposing on the Palestinians. It, it could be uh, people uh, in, uh, in any, any place in the world, in African countries, imposing, Mauritanian, Sudan, imposing on African people, you see? So, so it's an imposition. Normally we say it's an imposition of an outside power, but uh, it could also 
be an internal situation, you see. So, so now how do you rid yourself of, of, normally of colonialism? I'm just talking, I'm going fast with this. You have to read my book to get more on this, okay? But here's, here's what I say. You can get rid of colonialism through revolution, military action, to end the occupation of foreign powers. And, and we have seen this. We, Africans have demonstrated this. This is what the Algerians did with the French, for example. I mean, we know that. We know that this is what happened when Free Limo in Mozambique uh, defeated the Portuguese and so forth. You, you can also have democratic change where, where you vote into power those who you want uh, to help you overthrow colonialism. To a certain degree, you can look back and say, well, maybe this is what happened with, um, uh, with Ghana. Uh, maybe this is uh, what happened with Nigeria. This is what happened with South Africa. Okay, Th then you can say, you can have a uh, negotiation with the colonialists for leaving. J just as, for example, uh, the Zimbabweans tried to have uh, negotiations with the Rhodesians, and we, we know how that, that fared. But, but th th these are some of the ways that you can begin to do that. But now, why is it that uh, African nations are sometimes neo-colonial? And here's what I say. Many times they have simply put on the Western suits, stepped into the same offices, and used the same politics as the colonialists. They have, the, if those politics were ethnic conflicts used to retain power because you've divided the people, they use the same policy. They have rarely had vision, we've rarely had on the continent. I'm not saying we never had, we have had, but we have rarely had visionaries who could see beyond what they had inherited. If you inherit a system that has oppressed your people, if you inherited a government style that has been negative to African culture, why do you continue that practice? Why not interrogate your own historical relationship? Why not interrogate the systems of, uh, of the traditions of the people? Because the traditions of the people will give you the most stable forms of government. Nobody, I don't think, is going to march into Kumasi and Ghana and try to take over from the Asante Haney and say, you know, we got a coup d'etat here. No, you may do that in Accra, but you ain't going to do that in Kumasi with the with the, the, the paramount king of Asante. Because the people, that is the people's culture. That is what they know. That's what they believe. It's not grafted onto them. It is their reality. All African people have that reality in every country on the continent. But we have rarely interrogated. What's good about it? I'm not saying you have to take everything that we have done because everything we've done has not been good. But you have to look at yourself. This is how you find visionaries, people who could see beyond what they have inherited. And sometimes you find people who love the previous colonialists more than they love their ancestors. They are servants to the enslavers, to the colonizers, to the rapers of their own culture. I call this pattern neo, meaning new colonialism, you see? So, so the task of the decolonial uh, process that has been uh, developed. And let me just say this, uh, because I want people to understand that uh, there's some very bright and intelligent uh, people uh, who have worked on this. And there's some African, at least particularly one uh, in Lovu Gashini, who's worked on decolonialism very well and has written a very wonderful book. Uh, but uh, basically, the idea is a, a I, I call it an idea that comes out of uh, mostly the uh, so-called Latin world, where the emphasis is just like Edward Said's emphasis in his major classic book, Orientalism, is on finding a way around Europe but without going to Africa. 
Th that is the decolonial process. The de decolonialism itself, if you interrogate it, you are not going to find Kemet. You are not going to find Nubia. You are not going to find the fundamental values of African people, the earliest people in the world. The, 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 the longest history of civilization in the world, you're not going to find that in the decolonial process because that's not what they're looking for. The decolonialists are in effect very much pushing their own agenda. And let me just say this, because, you know, it's beautiful to be able to Zoom, and you can say many things on Zoom, you know, and, uh, and you, can have, you can talk freely. Uh, and uh, I, I need to say this, because in my visits and tri uh, trips uh, to the continent, um, I, I have found often that we uh, are very quick and easy to present uh, people that we consider to be for us who are not for us. Because basically what I've interrogated their works, their works is not really highlighting anything but Africa. Their works are highlighting Europe or if they speak in terms of Africa, if they talk about the South and what they can learn from the South uh, and how valuable the South is, meaning Africa, or South America. They're, they're not talking about us. They're talking about how can they revive Europe. That Europe, in effect, has no more questions to ask. It cannot find its way. It's just like the U.S. now in this moment of crisis. This is a big crisis. The people to save the U.S. are the Africans. Because we have, we have a value, we have an ethic. But when you got people who have no ethics and Trump has proved that he has no moral guidance, there's no ethical uh, compass to this man, you see? So who, somebody has to step in there and say, hey, wait a minute, this is the way we have to go. Well, this is what I mean. The decoloniality project is a task of delinking from the Northern European Western paradigm. And it's done deliberately. And it's good that it's done deliberately. But you can't just delete from the Northern European Western paradigm and then in, in, in impose another paradigm that is controlled by Europe. That, that doesn't make much sense to me in an African context. You see? Um, you, and, 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 and decoloniality is related to decolonization, but it's not the same thing. Because decolonization is when we took the political power. We say, okay, we're going to decolonize. We took the political power, we got in the government. But if you, you run the same government, then what you run into is that you got the certain, there's certain elements in that, in that system that you've got to change. You, you also have to take down the educational uh, uh, system because the purposes of the educational system that was set up under, under, under colonization, that system, if it remains in an African country, will necessarily have to uh, be dealt with because it would be a colonialism system. That, that's what they created the school system for, to go right along with the political and economic power. So if you do that, you also as Dub would say, you have to take down support for the patriarchy, which is about ranking of people, one above the other. The male is above the female, you see. The white is above the black, and so on. You have to destroy the whole platform that generates the episteme, that is how you get knowledge, that's what the episteme is. You have, whatever, whatever platform generates that episteme, you, you, have, to, you have to deal with. You've got to, you've got, you got to, you got to question that. Now, the moment of truth, I think, is what I call the collapse of the Western structure of colonies, um, the the rise of China, uh, the population explosion in Africa, and this is something that we haven't even paid much attention to. I'm telling you, um, uh, recently I was in Ethiopia. All right, 
in Ethiopia, uh, it's interesting because I was there with my wife, Anna, and we, we just looked around. We said, there are a lot of people in Ethiopia. There are millions of people in Ethiopia. It turns out that Ethiopia is the second largest black country in Africa, I mean, second largest African country after Nigeria. It used to be Egypt, but Ethiopia surpassed Egypt about two years ago. It's, um, it's they're growing rapidly. It's big and boisterous. It's, Nigeria is even bigger and more boisterous. In fact, Lagos, Nigeria is the largest city in the world. The second largest is Shanghai. But Lagos, Nigeria has 28 million people. You think about that. And the population of Africa, the average age is 19, which means that there will be many more children coming. And the population of Africa is going to just really go through uh, the ceiling because uh, Nigeria will be, in a few years, uh, probably the third uh, most populous nation in the world after uh, uh, China and India. So, 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 so this is, it will surpass, it will surpass, it's, it is, it will surpass Brazil and the United States. And uh, of course, it's been surpassed Russian Federation, which only has 125 million people. You see, so, so we have to look forward to this and we have to understand that this is what is happening in the world right now. This whole police brutality thing, yeah, we got to fight that. The police have been killing our brothers and sisters. We got to fight it, but we got to get to the root of the problem, which is this hierarchical system that has created this. And the contest uh, for the control of this uh, colonial matrix uh, is gonna be between Russia, uh, Brazil, I think is gonna be very important. Uh, South Africa is gonna be important, uh, China and India. And then of course, Ethiopia. I think these are the countries that are going to be in contest uh, with the old Northern European and American dominated uh, uh, colonial and settler uh, populations. Now, now, how do we re rid ourselves of mental oppression? And we'll go real quick on this. We need educational reform. Uh, we need uh, Afrocentric focus on all issues of culture. And we need to confront all biases with energy. And we need to honor human beings. Now, this is, this is the problem and this is the issue. Uh, I've just been asked yesterday, I think it was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, two days ago, Friday, uh, if I would write a book, a quick book, if you write a quick book on, on race, and my, my answer uh, technically is not, I'm not going to write a book on race. Um, I, I don't believe like uh, uh, Wilson did, uh, William uh, Wilson, uh, that uh, Julius Wilson, that uh, of the, the, um, uh, the, the declining significance of race. I, I'm not, that's not my position. That was a bad position. Uh, my position is that, that actually uh, the way to get at this is from an Afrocentric way where we go back to the comedic idea of the value of all human beings. And this is why you saw the relationship between the men and the women in ancient Kemet, which was uh, different than this notion of domination and power that we have inherited for the last 500 years with the European experience. And even before that with the, with I think with the Arab experience, you see uh, this dominating experience uh, that, that brought about many, many bad things and also gave us many of the biases that people have about different things. So, so as I say with, with Ibram's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, I wanna deal with how to be and anti uh, hierarchies. I mean, I think that that's that. Or, or how do you be a, an anti uh, patriarch? I mean, th those those would get us closer to this idea that the Europeans set up in the 15th, uh, 16th, and 17th century when uh, they began to have this classification of races based on how people look. 
because the, because even if you, if you say there were classification, we said, no, that, that's no problem. The people are different. That, that is true. But when you start saying by the difference, you can also detect how smart people are, uh, whether these people are going to be uh, brilliant, whether they're going to be this, that, or the other. And then you do that on the basis of the biology and the ranking, then that's where you create a hierarchical situation that even if you get rid of all of its symptoms that hurt people, you still have this generation, this gener generator in the minds of people. The, the white police, even you get rid of these police who do this brutality, the rest of them believe the same thing. Even the black ones believe it sometimes. So, so you got black police who have also inherited this notion, this intellectual notion that the black person out there is probably going to commit crime. And why? Well, well he's black. <laughs> you know, why? why? He's, and, the, and, the, and the darker he is, oh, the more likely he is to commit a crime. You see what I mean? Th that is it. And I touched a little bit on this in my book, Erasing Racism, but I didn't go deep into it. Uh, it when I wrote Erasing Racism, that's, that's what I wanted to deal with. And then when Cornell West wrote his book, Race Matters, I thought about this. It's true that race does matter. And I, I, it is true also that there are race matters, but the race matters, they have to be looked at. They have to be looked at as symptoms, you see? Because that's why my, my new book is gonna be called something like Beyond Race Matters, The Quest for Humanity. Because, because part of it, if you see me as a human and I see you as a human, then I don't even need to ask you a question about your complexion. I don't even need to know about your class, your gender, nothing. We are human beings. And, and in fact, as my son told me the other day, it goes, for, it goes for organic things too, like trees. Or it goes for inorganic things. It may even go for, for stone. If you see something living, what makes us better than the pig? What makes us better than the chicken, the hen? What makes human being, I mean, so this question of beingness, this question of this quest for a moral order that would give us something that's more valuable than what we have inherited from the West, that's what I'm looking for. And that I think was what, many of our most uh, intelligent writers, people like Francis Cress Welsing and Asa Hilliard and Ivan Van Sturdum and Sheikh Anta Joe, Maulana Kareem. That's what we've been looking for. How do you find humanity? How do you control, um, how do you control or de or de-link from the control of white, su uh, uh, white supremacy? Because, because you don't need white people to have white supremacy. You can see white supremacy in India. You can see white supremacy in Japan. I, I saw bleaching creams in Japan, walking around Japan, there were bleach, bleaching creams. So you don't need, you don't, you don't need uh, uh, white supremacists. I mean, you, you can go to black churches right now throughout this country and you can see white Jesuses over the, over the platform behind the, behind the, uh, where the preacher stands. The, 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 that, that exists because it's an idea. And this is the idea that generates the problems. This is the idea that gives us the problems, you see? African people must take agency because if we take agency, it contradicts the hierarchical idea. We have to take our, to our own agency, that we have to be centers of, of our own, in our own historical record. Uh, we can't be marginal to our own history. We have to start with classical Africa, which is before Hindu, before Jewish, before Arab, before Germanic ranking ideas. Afrocentricity brings humanity to the front. And that's the, the, the fundamental message that I have because the, the basis for all the disciplines of social science in the West 
are really the inheritance from the Greek and the Latin cultures. Uh, it's not based on geese, not, not even based on, uh, based on Marietic, not based on uh, Kemetic, Chikam uh, uh, language. Even in Europe, it's not based on Russian, it's not based on Hindi and China, Latin, Latin and Greek. Even the Russian is based on Latin and Greek, you see. Uh, uh, and so you, you get these funny things here. So Africology should be, should be Sarujta. That's the name we probably should have had, Sarujta, which is restoration. This is, should, the Afrocentric University would have had that top, you see. If you're taught that black people are inferior and you accept that without argument, uh, I, I think you will discover that anti-racism is pointless because the question is how do you break this notion of white racial domination that's in the name of the, of, of, and, and in the mind of the white world. And uh, there, there are many more things I could say, but I wanna save some time uh, for you to, to uh, be able to uh, ask me some questions and, uh, or to, to, to make a statement, small statements if you have. Uh, but I want you to know that Afrocentricity is to, uh, to me the key because we're trapped in debating the terms and the assumptions that have been established by the very people who wanted to have a dominating advantage. And you'd start debating their terms and their assumptions it won't get you far. It would get you uh, um, possibly if you scream loud enough and if you put enough political pressure, it would get them to uh, change uh, the way that whether they're going to kill you by a chokehold or some other way, but it will not get you uh, a change in the mentality. In, in 1885, the brilliant African, Antonor Fearman, uh, wrote a book on the equality of the races. And this is before Du Bois had gained his, uh, his footing, uh, intellectual footing. And people sometimes forget about Fearman. But Fearman was responding to Arthur Gobineau's uh, book that was called The Essay on the Inequality of the Human Races. This was a, a, a Frenchman who had written this book trying to show that the human races were in, uh, unequal and that the white race was at the top. And so uh, after he had done this in the 1850s, uh, a young man grew up uh, in Haiti and uh, decided that he would write a response. And his response on the equality of the races is one of the most incredible books ever published. And it's now published in, in English but it shows you the brilliance of black people in the sense of humanity that black people have always had in relationship to other people. And, uh, and this brings me to uh, the paper that I just uh, read by Dr. Dove, which was on the development stages of humans and how Europe had talked about hunter-gatherers, ancestral reverence, matriarchy, monotheistic religion, urbanity, materiality and profit. And then I ask myself the question, even the names that people have, when they start talking about uh, hunters and gatherers, they don't even, I mean, to me, when I say, when I think of hunters and gatherers, I think of scientists and explorers. That's what I think of. Somebody had to decide what was edible and what was not. Somebody had to test it. Somebody had to go across the ridge and go to the other valley uh, mountain and see what was over there. You, so, so you had, so, so how Europe, see, this is what I'm saying, how Europe defines these terms, how Europe sees other people, hunters and gatherers, they see that as on the, as, as on the lower ranking because they've set up this structure, you see, this, and that's the structure that has to be torn down. We got to destroy that ladder. And once we destroy that ladder, I think then we will not have as many of the problems that we have had in terms of uh, the pursuit of the social uh, sciences and, 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 uh, and also the pursuit of information and knowledge. And I, I would love to see more African people 
respond to this in a way that would give us the bigger picture and make us uh, more uh, uh, positive about our own history and our own culture, because that, in my judgment, is the best way for us to act. So uh, I'm going to 